Welcome to this presentation about Kalman filtering. Kalman filtering can be used to combine multiple observations of the same system to a coherent estimate of the state of that system. And it's based on describing every measurement as a, a sample from a probability uh, distribution. So it acknowledges that there are some uncertainties in all the measurements that we actually do. And by knowing the size of these uncertainties, we're able to combine them in a best possible way. And this is actually what the Kalman filtering is doing. Before we really get started, uh, we should have some basic things in, in place like what is a continuous probability distribution and what are the requirements for, for such a distribution. And that's, um, if, if we have a function pfx, um, then it must have two properties uh, for it to, to be a probability density uh, distribution, probability distribution function, that is one of the properties is that it should be non-negative so that all values of the function should be zero or larger. Um, and the second pro um, property is that if you take an integral over the entire range of the x values um, over this uh, integral, the area below the curve should be exactly one. And we could try to, to draw um, different uh, probability density fun or distribution functions here. So we have one here, which is uh, a box. It is zero on these uh, parts out here. And then within this uh, box, uh, the height of the box should be so that the area within the box x is exactly one. So that could be one distribution and we could also imagine a, a different kind of distribution uh, something that would more or less looks like uh, this um, this is a, a bell curve it should have the same property as the area below the, the curve should be exactly one um, but it has a, a maximum and again some with or region within uh, where we would uh, expect to, to see uh, see observations. And there are many other kinds of, of uh, probability density functions. Um, for the Kalman filter, it actually uh, relies on, on using a specific set of uh, probability density function, and that is uh, the normal distribution. The normal distribution is, is built on uh, using this uh, equation. Um, so we have that p of x is equal to some uh, fraction here. So we have the square root of 2 pi times the uncertainty squared. So I'm also pull this uncertainty out front and then uh, multiply it with e raised to the minus and then the difference between the x value and the mean value of the distribution that is uh, the center value here squared divided with two times the uncertainty squared this is the expression for the normal distribution and um, yeah that would be u plus our uncertainty U minus R and 70. And this uh, distribution has a tendency to, to come, it, come up in many different locations. Um, and therefore, it's also um, um, nice that the Kalman filter is able to, to deal with this one. So, so far, now we have the um, probability density function we need to, to use for the Kalman filter and uh, we're able to, to specify that 
we have a measured value and we also have an uncertainty of that measured value. And the normal distribution can look, uh, if you adjust for scaling, uh, the normal distribution actually just looks like itself, uh, independent on, on the values of the mean value and uh, um, the uncertainty of the distribution. Here we have tried to, to plot uh, four different uh, distributions, all different uh, mean values and all different um, standard deviations. And the things that have changed here is that the mean value is all, always where the peak of the function is. So one is here and zero was here, 180 was here. While the width or the uncertainty of the distribution is related to the width of the curve here at approximately uh, half its height. Um, or maybe a bit uh, higher up than, than half the height. So uh, the, the normal distribution uh, looks like itself when it's scaled. Um, but if we try not to scale it, um, then uh, we can see how it actually will uh, differ a bit in, in the width here and uh, how it can be displaced from, from side to side and, and so on. Okay. So, now the idea of the, of the Kalman filter is to use knowledge of both the measurements but also knowledge about the system that we are looking at. So let's see if we can formalize this a, a bit. And for this we would rely on uh, what is known as a state space model that allows us to describe what is the next state we're looking at. So x k plus one. Actually, I used i plus one here. And that should, the state of the system in the next time step um, is given by the state in the curious position, current position, so xi that we had. And it should be multiplied with a state transition matrix. And then we can add some, um, what was that named? Uh, some control input. That was control. So the idea is if you know the current state of the system, you can apply the state transition matrix to get a better sense of where you would end up in the next time step. And you can do something similar here if you know how you want to control the system. If you press on a speeder in a car, for instance, you will know it would start to accelerate. And if you know that you're asking it to accelerate, you can also update your prediction about the model with whatever control input you actually put into it. And that's described by this uh, beam matrix that maps how the control input maps to changes in, in the state space. So far, so good. And finally, we also have a measurement of the system. And the measurement is depicted by this uh, yi value given by a matrix uh, C multiplied with the state of the system at, at uh, time i. So this is our measurement. And this is the mapping from state to measurement. So this is our space, well, a state space model. 
that allows us to predict the new position given the previous. And it also tells us how we can um, get measures of the system. And what the Kalman filter is actually able to do is given knowledge about the structure of the state space model and the state transition matrix, it can estimate the value of the state of the system or the full state of the system given measurements of only a part of the system. And we'll take a closer look at how that actually works in, in a few moments. So a very simple uh, state space model we have here is uh, the system where we have a state transition matrix A, which is the identity matrix of only a single element. Um, this also means that this should be able to be multiplied with the state um, of the system. So that should also be a scalar or a one by one matrix. And we have no control inputs to change this value. So therefore B will be zero. So we can leave that part out. And finally, when we measure on the system, C is given to one, so we can actually measure directly on, on the system. So here is how we update the system. We multiply this matrix, then we get the new state. And to uh, predict what we would measure from this state would again be to, to multiply with C, and that would give us our um, measure value. A bit more uh, difficult um, or a bit more involved system um, or state space model is, is given here where you are tracking both the position, velocity and acceleration of some kind of object um, and you want to update how your position is you both need to have attention to what your previous position was how your previous velocity was and how your previous acceleration was. And when you take all these elements into account, together with the time step, this uh, delta t, you're able to predict, okay, where would you end up being after a single time step? And similar, where would you, how would you, where would your velocity end up and where would your acceleration end up, assuming it doesn't change, but the rest uh, will, will change. What is interesting down here is that you, when you measure on this system, you're not able to measure the acceleration or the velocity um, of the system directly because the measurement mapping matrix is, is given here and it's only a value, a non zero value that is multiplied to the x1 i value. So you're only able to measure the position of this uh, system. But if you repeatedly measure the position of the system, you can infer, not, uh, infer information, or you can obtain information about the, the current velocity and acceleration of the system by utilizing knowledge about how the state transition matrix is uh, constructed. So one thing to discuss uh, with yourself, or at least uh, think a bit about, is when is the system linear? That is, uh, what type of system can we actually use this uh, plain Kalman filter for? I would suggest you to to think of, of this in, in a few uh, minutes time and then uh, go on with, with the lecture. So. Let's take an overview of the Kalman filter, how it actually works, and then see, uh, uh, look into a, a specific example of a visualization of, of the state space. Um, that is the inner working of, of this uh, Kalman filter. So the general form of this is you want to estimate the, the state of uh, your system XK based on a prediction of what you had uh, before and your control input and some kind of noise that will add to the system. 
and in addition you also are given a measurement uh, of the system defined by the measurement matrix multiplied with the uh, current state of, of the system and again plus some noise and you want to use this uh, measurement as best as possible to update your idea about the state of the system and the approach used for for this is the following uh, setup that was uh, defined by by the Swedish engineer Kalman back in yeah a long time ago um, and the idea is you start with some kind of estimate for both the state and also the uncertainty of the state and it's important not to just have one of these uh, you need to have both so you know okay what state do I think I'm in and how sure am I that I'm within this state and then the the Kalman filter works in, in two steps you make a prediction so assume that you're right in the initial guess down here and your um, uh, covariance matrix that describes the uncertainty of, of this um, this estimate then you project that state uh, one step ahead by multiplying with the straight transition matrix and taking account of any uh, control inputs and this provides you with a new state of the system and then you take all your um, or you uh, position uncertainties or state uncertainties um, represented by the um, uh, covariance matrix uh, P K um, and you project that one step ahead and add what is known as the process noise that ensures that well when you are using this uh, state transition matrix um, it will often be a bit incorrect and to account for that there'll be some noise added down here so now you have a prediction of where you expect to be and then you can go on to actually do the update uh, what should be known here is that if you don't get a new measurement uh, down here you can repeat this update part uh, multiple times and then when you have done that uh, enough times uh, you can actually uh, use your, your measurement so it doesn't need to be one predict state and one measurement update but it could be two or three predict states and then a single measurement update or even the opposite way around uh, one predict state and maybe multiple measurement updates from different sensors okay so to compute the, the Kalman gain which is the first step here and the Kalman gain defines how much should I rely on the on on my previous estimate of the system and how much should I rely on the new uh, measurement uh, that we're given and what takes place here is that we have this uh, HT matrix or the H matrix which is a state um, do, 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 do. which maps um, the, the probabilities in, in the right way um, okay this is a mapping from the state space to the measurement space if I recall correctly and then you add the uncertainty of the measurement itself and all then is that included in, in this uh, Kalman gain then you update your estimate of the system using the new measurement uh, CK based on your prediction and then plus something times the Kalman gain 
uh, where you have the difference between the measurement and your predicted measurement. So if you predicted exactly what was measured, then your state was a good guess, so you can continue uh, using that. Uh, if you guessed wrongly, uh, then you will update your estimate of the system state um, accordingly, so you will get closer to, uh, to the right state. And finally, we update the error, error covariance matrix pk down here. Using the equation here again, we rely on the Kalman gain, and then we can take one step further through this uh, loop and make a new prediction, make an update, a new prediction, an update, and so on. So a few examples of how this can, can be structured. Again, we go back to this uh, example where, where the state of the system is uh, unchanged, uh, at least according to our model. Um, and what is given here uh, is that we need to figure out, okay, how should we determine the, the process noise? And how should we determine the measurement noise? And which initial value should we use for both the initial state of the system, but also for the covariance matrix of, of the system? And one approach for assigning these values is that X0 could be set to more or less anything. Uh, 0, 1, or 10,000, or a million or so, as long as P0 is set is set to a very, very large value, which means that when the uncertainty of something is very large, we don't trust that value uh, much. So that would be a, a useful um, value to, to start with. In uh, this example here, we want to track the position and velocity of some kind of object, but we are only allowed to estimate or measure the position of that object. And we have this uh, um, uh, state transition matrix down here with uh, 1, delta t, and c on 1. So let's take a look at, at how that can, can actually be done. I've tried to make a set of um, visualizations of the state space of, of such a system. And where we start up here is to say that, okay, we have a guess of the velocity and position both to be zero and with a large uncertainty on, on both values. And then to actually measure something like this, we would say that we would measure the position with a low uncertainty, but also measure the uh, velocity with a, with a very high uncertainty, which means that we cannot really use this measurement for, for anything. But let's take a look at how that actually looks like. So when we have initialized our system, we have this uh, state space estimate uh, where we have a velocity of zero and a position of zero where we have the maximum. And these are contour lines of um, the probability density function we are using here, uh, multivariate normal distribution. Um, so this is our current state we, we assume to be within, and the uncertainty is quite li large, which we can see that the lines are very far from each other, and that's the case in, in both directions. We take the state estimate and then we use the, the model from before the state transition matrix to predict, okay, where would the state end up? And if we have a positive velocity here, uh, when we do the st uh, state update, that point will be moved uh, to the right because we have a positive velocity. And if you have a negative velo velocity down here, it would be moved to the left. And therefore, this seems to be rotated a bit, or at least uh, skewed a bit. So this is our predicted state, and from the predicted state, we can uh, see what we would expect to read on our sensor. In fact, these two would be completely identical when we can 
measure both values in a two day um, in, in this two D uh, sensor space, um, and this expected sensor reading will be combined with the actual sensor reading uh, that I have uh, visualized down here. And the actual sensor reading is given as a position where we have uh, a quite low uncertainty loss on that is the width of, of this uh, distribution, but we have a very large uncertainty on the velocity of that because the sensor doesn't sense the velocity. So we have just said that the velocity can be more or less anything. And then we try to combine the expected center, sensor reading and the actual sensor reading, and we get this merged sensor reading and or merge sensor reading or merge uh, state estimate so this is our updated uh, state estimate that okay we have a sensor reading that says us we are approximately here but we have no clue about the velocity of the system right now and then we'll try to go through this uh, once again where we have the state estimate here that was our merged uh, sensor reading from before. That becomes our new state estimate. We predict the new state based on that. And again, if we have a point up here, it's moved to the right, and the point down here is moved to the left. So this gives us a predicted state. And this is a covariance matrix that defines the orientation and width of, of these uh, lines. And we can also say the expected sensor readings, and we can combine that with a new position measurement uh, of the system and now we are combining the actual sensor reading with the expected sensor reading and now a really good thing um, comes out of this because the expected sensor reading has an uncertainty but it's not going up and down it's tilted in a, in a certain direction and the actual sensor reading has the uncertainty in a different direction which means that uh, where these two uh, distributions intersect, we get a quite high value, and out of these regions, the the system is unlikely to, to be, and therefore we have a much better sense of okay, what is actually position here on the x-axis, but also it, it's the velocity uh, here, and we can combine this for for a few steps. So again, we have our improved state estimate that we predict uh, a new state with. We expect some sensor re readings. We have our actual sensor readings and we can merge them together. And what happens here is that the uncertainty of the sensor reading or the state estimate goes down. So we become more and more confident in whatever we are predicting uh, using this setup. Good. That was the first part about Kalman filtering.